Welcome to the Lipstick Pickup Podcast with Emily Walters and Robert Mache. I'm a music lover in Nashville, and he's a Memphis-based guitarist. We set up a party line where we discuss our mutual obsession with the lore and sound of lipstick pickups and the music they inspired. I think I'll give Robert a call now, and we hope you'll pick up and listen in. Ring, ring. Hello, Emily. It's so good to see you again. <sighs> is this the unmistakable voice of Dr. Robert Mache? Yeah, you're right. Sure is. <sighs> I'm so glad to hear it and see you today. I'm glad to be back. Uh, this is Emily with the Lipstick Pickup, and I'm talking to my cohort, Robert, today. I'm calling him in Memphis because he's finally there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He has been gone. Today is the ninth, right? So like six weeks almost. Yeah. Yeah. You left in mid um, late late, late March. March. Yeah. That's a long time, and I know it was a whirlwind for you. Mm-hmm. And when you when you he's been down in New Orleans, uh, we're going to call this episode lip service. <laughs> Like because it. this episode is going to be about uh, Robert telling me about what all he went to New Orleans for. I know a little bit, and I actually went down there to see him, but he was so busy working that it, we were two ships that passed in the night. So I want to hear all about what he did down there. And we we're going to give. Li- we hardly got to hang out at all. You were a working man. It was all business. Mm-hmm. The, the entire month of April, I know you had fun, but you worked like a dog mm-hmm. um and i it was exciting to watch but we haven't had our usual chattiness you know we're used to accustomed to uh recording at least once a week and then keeping up during the week but you were too busy um you were just incredibly busy and i've missed you so and we're going to hear all about that but i've got official business uh okay. lipstick pickup business to discuss before we get into um, you telling us about your stay in New Orleans. Um, you know, it's, I, we first, we, you and I have been working on these podcasts for a half of a year, but it wasn't until March that we published them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people wondered why we were doing it that way. And we wanted people to know it was a, at least have a compo- you know, a composition of different recordings so people would know what it's about. Um, right. So we were, uh, we, uh, you know you've you've been gone as i've been continuing to post these things and um watch our numbers and get fan mail and you know we haven't talked about that much and i like where we're going with this um we um we have regular listeners and i get enough information from our buzzsprout when i uh post an, another one i get all of the I don't get all of the numbers because it's just downloads, which means Mm -hmm. uh, people downloaded it to a device, but I do get their geographic location. And Robert, they are not people that you and I know. They're not our friends necessarily. They are enjoying the uh, conversation. And whenever I post a new one, I immediately get a bunch of downloads, which means people are out there going, thank you very much. I'll take another. I love that. I love that. I love that. We have a worldwide community. Yeah, and it's, I love this. it's burgeoning, but it's growing. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to tell you that's good news. You've been running around working your head off, uh, but I've been watching the numbers and posting things on YouTube and replying to uh, fan mail, and um, it's good. It's, it's still modest, but we just started. And you've been gone a lot of this whole time, and I hadn't had a chance to give you enough attaboys about how great we're doing. <laughs> Um, so I wanted, uh, I know that we've kept up a little bit, but I dialed in some sympathetic strings while you were gone. A reminder to the listener. Very exciting. It was fun. I talked to Patrick Sweeney, who's a Mm -hmm. blues guy here in town twice. And it was amazing to have his input. Um, Pete Hayes. He's great. He's he's, really great. He's really great. I, I, have you, do you think you guys have ever met? It's possible. I don't but think so. Do you know if you've ever met him so. in person? But I want to hang out with him now. 
I um, yeah, I'd like to hook you two up. Y'all will hit it off. <laughs> he's, the, he's the real deal, just like you, a working man. Um, I talked to my friend, uh, the drummer, drummer for the Figs, uh, Pete Hayes, and I also talked to Pete Donnelly. And I talked to a local guy here, Matthew Page, who gave me lessons on a real sitar. I know you haven't had time to watch it because you've been too busy. Oh, I did I did see a few, uh, a minute of the, the real sitar thing. It's like, it's kind of like a hybrid sitar. Yeah, it's a modern yeah. sitar. Yeah, it's really, um, really cool. And he's, you know, you didn't go and get someone that, you know, some precious one, just like a ukulele. You can spend hundreds on them, but you can also get one for 50. But mm -hmm. it sounds legitimate. And he's also humble. He's not a claiming to be an authority on it, but he's been playing it. He likes exotic instruments. And he gave me a little bit of lesson about it. And we had a great chat. Um, but we've gotten lots of fan mail. And yesterday I had the stones to finally go back and listen to my conversation with Ben Vaughn and post it. <laughs> it was sitting in there in my to be posted. I uh, needed to review, to listen to it. I have to listen to the whole thing. I try not to edit anything, but every now and then there's some things that need to go, you know, like a dog barking or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to re-listen to it. And I was almost nervous to re-listen to it because, you know, I was nervous to talk to him, but I'm happy with it. Uh, I, he uh, he's a, a fascinating guy and a super pro, and I didn't stand in his way too much. <laughs> he's we a got all I love him. It, we got some good stuff. I posted that yesterday, cool. and it was a reminder. One reason why I've been putting it off is that you and I want to talk about um, Philly Soul. Oh yeah, and he was going to get us get us started. What ended up happening is I picked his brain about Reggie Young and Joe South and all this other stuff, but he did get me started on Philly Soul. And while you've been gone, I've been doing some research because whenever we do get around to making a recordings, we want to make two more on mm -hmm. and maybe as many as we damn want to because Philly Soul <laughs> deserves a lot of attention. <laughs> That's big. Philly Soul um, is a big one. I mean, you got three guys, uh, Gamble, Huff, and um, Tom Bell. Mm -hmm. It's anyway, it, it's a lot to cover. I've been doing research, and before we get into uh, to, to you telling me about New Orleans, I want to tell you about one of the things that I came up with I, in my research about Philly Soul. One good thing about if you're interested in Philly Soul, there's a lot out there on YouTube and archive because they have a lot of respect for their the people in Philadelphia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and people in music and the academic community there have a lot of respect for um, what they achieved and the you know they're at in with the sound of Philly and all its incarnations and uh, Drexel University has a a student-run um, archival imprint uh, that is, um, it, it's all about them keeping uh, the archive of Sigma Sound, because there's not only all those recordings, but there's tons of stuff that never made, never even got published. Mm -hmm. If you think about how busy a recording studio like that would have been back then. So we're just sure. now, we're just now starting to unearth uh, the th some of the things that were, co were recorded there, thanks to the, all of this archive footage and um, this program at um, Drexel University. So I went to go watch a talk about uh, their program and some of the music that they are unearthing, and they wanted to talk about a band called the Nat Turner Rebellion. Okay. The reason why you've never heard it and I've never heard it, but it might sound familiar, is that nobody ever heard about them. Uh, th first of all, I want you to know that the Nat Turner Rebellion was actually the, the name of an actual slave rebellion mm -hmm. that I didn't know about. And I've read up on it, and, and that was a real ballsy choice. Uh, for an African American band to name a band that the Nat, you know, in, at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so I went to go listen to their record, and this is what they. First, I want to tell you just a couple of things about them, and I'll play a few seconds, and then we'll get on to business. Um, apparently, they did come from Peters, Petersburg, Virginia, but they came 
uh, to Philadelphia to record, okay. and they toured extensively. Um, they made a record at uh, Sigma Sound that never got released, and it is called... I'll pull it up because I'm going to play a song for you. Um, anyway, they weren't even a one-hit wonder. They were a great band, and they toured a lot, and they made this one record and never got released. Wow. And it's one of the crown jewels that Drexel, these kids, these students uh, at this imprint at Drexel University has unearthed, and people have listened to it and have considered it a lost masterpiece. Fantastic. And one reason wh why it might sound familiar to both you and I even – with this is that apparently it came out in 2019 or 2020 and it got some play on the whole record day thing. I, mm, okay. I don't keep up with a lot of those things, you know, the big, this is a thing that we're, they're going to do on record store day. You got to mm -hmm. have it. Apparently it's a big hit with all the hipsters, this record. Excellent. And, um, it's a fascinating story and I've been learning about them. And I, what I want you to know is that, there's electric sitar on every track. No way. Yes. <laughs> it's a, an electric sitar masterpiece. And I want you to hear... Um, okay, I must, must, must have this album. Every track is that good. Fantastic. Wow. Nat Turner wow. Rebellion, wow. folks. Nat Philadelphia. Turner Rebellion. Okay. Not only I'm did in. they put out all that music, but stuff like that was sit sitting in the basement, and they're still, they're still sorting it out. It's a masterpiece. I knew you'd love it. That's why I've waited for you to come home for me to tell you about it. I cannot wait to dig into this one. <laughs> okay. Thank you Let's for that. It's good stuff. Um, let's talk about Robert Mache. I'm still confused about all the stuff that you do down there. Tell oh, me about your secret life in New Orleans. I work the art department. I'm the printer for the art department uh, at Jazz Fest. So basically, when you go to Jazz Fest in New Orleans, everything that you see, we make it. Everything that you see, that there's a couple of things that are sponsored like Rockstar or Maui Jim or something mm -hmm. like that, but everything else we make it. It's either carved out of foam, it's printed and mounted. It's um, it's a ridiculous amount of stuff. There's a, there's a uh, big statue of Professor Longhair on one one main stage there's a big statue of um, Fats Domino they're both playing their pianos on the other stage and we carve them we carve them out of foam and they're massive they're like you know 20 feet long it's crazy you carve them out of foam and then you use printing on like a no, we, we carve them out of foam, and then they get painted. Okay. And then that, and the foam is kind of flat on the back, um, and that gets put up on, on wooden frames and attached to the stage, and it looks really, really, really good. You can't mess around us, New Orleans. Yeah. And and it was a, it was a great bunch of bands for, it was... They're getting younger kids in there now. They're getting all sorts of younger kids. They had Hozier there. Um, they had uh, Foo Fighters. They um, uh, just widespread panic. Okay, you know, I they, want to remind you that the Foo Fighters are old people. I know they're old people, but <laughs> but but then for people of my generations and Candace's yeah. generation, they I have know, I know. art. Heart was all there. about and relativity, say, right? <laughs> I have to say, those Wilson sisters bring it. They are still so amazing. 
and and um, then the Rolling was Stones. Was that were Candace's there. first? Did was that Candace's first heart concert, yes. or had she seen? No, that was her first one. She was in heaven. And then uh, the next Thursday, the Rolling Stones were there. And we got passes into the guest area, so we were right up front. And I have to say, Mick is in fine form and in absolutely great voice. They put on an amazing, amazing show. I was so happy. Keith, he's getting a little bit addled, but he's still Keith. He, I mean, when he rips into he's been that way for forty years. Yeah, when he <laughs> rips into honky tonk women, he's right there, and it's it's just that sound. It's that undeniable sound. It was fantastic, and seeing Ronnie Wood playing the uh, baby sitar, yes. just like that one behind you, on Paint It Black. That was for the fun. listener. I just fun. leaned over yeah. to show. That I too have a Jerry Jones baby sitar, and I, I could have bought a new one. I could have bought a vintage Dano. I could have bought a cheap reproduction. I decided to, well, on the Jerry Jones because Ron Wood, that's what he plays mm-hmm. on mm-hmm. Uh, when he does paint it black, and he's done it for years. It's nothing yeah. new, too. So, yeah. All right. Back so the to Stones, Stones totally talk. brought it, um, and they had Irma Thomas up there to sing her song. Time is on my side, which the Rolling Stones stole from Irma Thomas. <laughs> so they finally, finally got to pay it back to Irma. And she she just owned that song. She handed Mick his ass back. <laughs> it was fantastic. And um and then uh let's see, Neil Young was he was Neil Young, he was amazing incredible set list and he did a solo version of ohio because it was may 4th and it was the anniversary of the shooting yeah so that was very very powerful irma thomas did her own set um there's a million people i'm forgetting oh we had side of stage seats for uh, Bonnie Raitt, who was incredible. And in the meantime, Dana Kurtz and I did um, club gigs. We we did that show you saw with Lulu and the Broadside. And um, Rosie Flores sat in. And, and we had just seen, you and I had just seen Rosie Flores featured in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Yeah, um, I want to ask you, do you know how many times you played while you were down there on this trip? Did you keep a count? Because it seemed like you were playing, and sometimes it was during the day, and that you were able to work the long days that you were working with the art department and then go out and play at night and then wake up at the crack of dawn the next morning. Yeah. It, it, it's, <laughs> Look at Ray. I was tired just watching him. <laughs> <laughs> it does take its toll, but I was behaving. Yeah. Yeah, and so and the festival was fantastic. So, how many times do you think you performed while you were down there? It just seemed like Probably every probably not that many, maybe uh, half a dozen only. Last year, lot. I had fourteen, no, eighteen, eighteen, and it almost killed me, literally, because the Continental Drifters were in town too. Last year, well, I'm glad they didn't come back to finish you off, but that would have <laughs> been great. <laughs> Oh, and Lulu and the Broadsides played our set at the festival. Ah, cool. And that was very, very well received. That was beautiful. What stage, um, did, how many stages do they have at Jazz Fest? Like eight or ten mm-hmm. going on at once. You know, I've never been. Like probably eight, eight major stages that you could run around and see music on at any time. <laughs> I've never been. Isn't well, that? Come on! I'll I know. Be it next year, come on. There, multiple Everybody times I've actually on. been in the city when it was going on, but I didn't go. And I'm going to tell the listener: uh, my husband Kevin and I were looking. We were wanting to go on a trip, and our usual dog sitter wasn't available. So I told him, I said, "Let's try to let's take a car trip that we think we could manage Lucy, our little." Mm-hmm. Jack Russell terrorist and uh, 
<laughs> so yeah. we went on a car. To, uh, we decided to go down to New Orleans. I said, uh, Candace and we'll be there with Robert, and he'll be just finally starting to, you know, finish off everything he's been working on. Maybe we'll go to the festival. Maybe we won't. But we'll go down there. And we went down there. And we chose a dog-friendly hotel, but... When we got there, we found out we couldn't leave the dog alone. So it kind of squelched our plans to try to go to the festival because we weren't going to take her. Anyway, I'm drawing it out. But I was not able to go to the festival, but it doesn't mean I didn't experience the excitement. But we also enjoyed the fact that many pe- most people were over on that side of town. Mm-hmm. And we uh, went and did some things on other sides of town. And I'm I'm going to tell you, we went to the old uh, street address of C. St. Studios. Right. Did I tell you? No. There's no, if it's there, I didn't see it. But there's no marker there. It's now a hair salon. I'm not surprised. I'm sad to say I'm not surprised. It's legendary. Mm Mm-hmm. Legendary. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm-hmm. Anyway. Marshall Seahorn and Alan Toussaint. (laughs) It's right there in mm-hmm. the Gentilly neighborhood, which I actually know well because I uh, had family by marriage who lived in that area, and I used to stay there on Franklin Avenue. So anyway, we went over there. We went to Algiers. We did other – you know, New Orleans just isn't all about the French Quarter. You know that more than anybody. Right. It's, oh, and one of the greatest neighborhood discoveries that we made, we, ha- we had to bring Lucy – but we had our car, mm-hmm. so Kevin and I decided that the one time we could see Robert perform with Lulu and the Broadsides, we went to a club called the Bywater. Oh, in, BJ's in the Bywater. Oh, um, BJ's in the Bywater. Yeah. And I didn't really realize that the Bywater is smaller on a, a granular scale, basically the ni- lower ninth ward. Or mm-hmm. Okay. I'd never been there. So that was an adventure in itself. And you said, hey, we're playing um, this night. And I said, uh, you said they got a big back garden and they allow dogs. And uh, they do. And we took mm-hmm. Lucy and uh, she behaved well for a while. And then we had to put her in. T- <laughs> she there was another well Jack Lucy. Russell there and she got mad. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so we put her in the car and she felt like, like a parent she used to do with their kids. <laughs> but it was cool. Mm-hmm. It was it was windy and cool. It was beautiful weather the oh, whole yeah. time we that were was there. Fantastic. So we we put her in the car and she fell right to sleep. It wasn't dog abuse. The window was open on a quiet street, and we went in there and saw and you guys do an amazing set. And this is what Robert was just telling y'all. Rosie Flores shows up. She I've seen her voice down. She's amazing. If you don't know who Rosie Flores is. Go find out right now, because she is a monster musician. Man, you can't miss her when she walks in the room. So, so, so much. I've seen her perform live. I saw her on the Outlaw Country Mm -hmm. Cruise, and I was like, wow, there's Rosie Flores. Rosie Flores. You and her go way back. You're friends from way back. Since about 1980. Yeah, and and I was yeah I feel like I know her now mm-hmm. um, through you, and when you and Candace came and we went to the Country Music Hall of Fame, Rosie Flor one of Re- Rosie Flores's Telecasters is there, but it has your Bigsby on it. I know. <laughs> I was like, Rosie, are you done with that Bigsby? And she's like, Well, you can have it back, but it's going to be three years because it's hanging up in the Country Music Hall of Fame right now. I'm like, oh. She's in the Country Music Hall of Fame, represented in the Western Edge exhibit, Mm -hmm. which is intended to recognize this genre of country music, which has happened around the West. And uh, she's an icon of that era. So it's still an icon. Mm -hmm. And I got to see it right up and close. Anyway, she shows up and yeah, the whole I told Kevin, I said, there's Rosie Flores. The next day, the whole band was like, hey, Robert, when could we play with Rosie again? Like, yeah. <laughs> She's the she bomb. W- she played your guitar, didn't she? Mm-hmm. What, that was your guitar. Somebody said, that isn't her normal guitar. I go, I know, that's Robert's guitar. <laughs> he lent it to her. And what were you playing? Um, your 
Les Paul or something? I think I was playing what my playing? red one, my, my Guild Starfire. Okay. Yeah, I was playing my Guild Starfire. Well, I... It was an amazing performance. And I want to give a shout out to this place, BJ's. Mm -hmm. It's a dive bar. Oh, it is. And proudly. I, it's proudly a dive bar. And it, it, I can tell it's a neighborhood cornerstone mm -hmm. because of the people in the bar. Mm -hmm. it, people are in music and they're supporting musicians. It almost like a perfect, almost like a perfect society. Mm -hmm. Is this the neighborhood in which um, Dana lives in when she lives down there half of the year? Yeah, she she just lives a block away. Uh, yeah, on Poland. It feels like a neighborhood place, and totally. Um, totally. The thing that I noticed as a music lover, I continue to examine this thing. It's a business. Mm -hmm. the, it's called the rock and roll business. And if you're, you, you may not be making a living at it. When I say you, I don't mean you, I mean anybody, but some people are trying to make money at it, trying to make all their money at it. You know, it's a business and it, there's a lot of different business models and what they've got going on in new Orleans. It feels like an attempt to self support people who perform for a living. Mm -hmm. And here's what I loved as a music lover. There was a steep, cover charge in which nobody balked and were happy to pay right with no fees going to anybody it's at the door right and it's a dive bar they're not spending it on ticket fees and all this and fancy new restrooms and you know, the restroom was fine everything i wanted they had delicious food in the backyard provided by a pop-up or food truck you know equivalent of a food truck uh, the service was great. The place is comfortable. It's clean. The toilet is fine. Looks like any reputable dive bar toilet. <laughs> <laughs> That's I took not a saying much. I took a selfie of of, of myself in it. In the, but it, it. I thought, yeah. And and she's taking tips and she's selling merchandise. And I, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at all these people and I'm doing the math and I'm going, this actually looks about right to me. Mm-hmm. Um, we I, made I just, good money that night. That's the thing about New Orleans. You can make a living playing music in New Orleans, which is not something you can do really in Nashville or Memphis unless you're playing in cover bands. It can be done. I had a I had an interesting uh, time yesterday. I always I'm trying to keep up with other musicians' podcasts to decide which ones I like, which ones I don't. I apologize for forgetting this guy's name, but I watched one and he's a guy around town. He's a touring musician. He's a guitarist with the band Shenandoah, mm -hmm. but he's got a YouTube channel where he seeks to inform people and build his business and he talks frankly about it about building his business about trying to have an income stream with this income stream with that mm -hmm. and he gave some realistic numbers about ma r playing guitar for a living in nashville and i was mm -hmm. like wow that was um informative about how little some of these guys make and some mm -hmm. of the things the pr most prestigious uh, assignments is a touring guy they're like uh, some of them bad you can't it's not all a uniform thing but there are some i there's some truisms and he does say there's some exceptions but he generally you know a lot of these high profile acts people would be happy to play with them just for the exposure <laughs> this is the thing in national like they get to put it all over their social media that they're playing with such and such and touring with them hoping that it'll mean more business to them but that some of these acts don't pay that much and he he told us he talked about all the scale and all this stuff and i thought if I was a professional guitar player in um, uh, Nashville, I'd be thinking about business models all the time. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's and it's like our dear friend Dan Montgomery says: people die from exposure. It's uh, Nashville is interesting, and there's mm -hmm. too many people doing it here to 
um, oversimplify it. I'm not attempting to oversimplify it, but I have been looking a long time at people struggling to make a living at this, and some people doing better jobs at others, and, and luck comes into play too, but also being realistic helps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> And what I saw there that night at, at uh, BJ's was a business model that makes a lot of sense to me. And everybody was having a great time. Yes. Yes and yes. Yes. So I want to know more about the art. Uh, I want to tell the listener that um, Robert and I did hope that we were going to record while he was down there. But it, you were just way too busy. But one time we FaceTimed and you took me on a tour of what is essentially your office. Mm -hmm. Is that, what occupies that space the rest of the year? Some kind of studio space or? Yeah, um, it's the people who started the crew of house floats. Because in in the pandemic, uh, Mardi Gras did not happen for a couple of years in the pandemic. And people missed the floats, they missed Mardi Gras. And so people, This studio, Stronghold Studios, started um, making uh, float decorations and uh, floats being like the the parade floats that Mm -hmm. go down the streets in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. And they're highly decorated with huge paper mache um, sculptures. And so this studio um, started making all sorts of sculptures for people's houses. And people decorated their houses like Mardi Gras floats. During the pandemic? During the pandemic. I did not know this. And so people in their neighborhood would walk down the street and see these (laughs) amazing houses that looked like big Mardi Gras floats. And and there were themes for them. Um, I did not know this. It was absolutely fantastic. So that's that's what they do a lot of the rest of the year, and um, and they're really really talented people. Yeah. Professional art studio. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There, you 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 walked me around. We were facetiming, and there's a, all these talented uh, couple of young women there working hard at the mural, and mm-hmm. it was an amazing facility. Um, and that you were bringing it back and forth. Here's a question I have for you. You started, when was your first job as a printer? My first job as a printer? Mm -hmm. Probably 1977 in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. And you were, that was your, was that your day job and that's why you did the work? That was my day job, yeah. And tell me about one of the iconic examples of your print work. <laughs> I want. The, we talked uh, about it before, but is it still there in your room? Uh, what? Your your uh, cramps. Um. Yeah, there it is. There's one right in back of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's the uh, it's I printed that one, and it's the Monster Bash one. It's probably one of the most famous cramps posters. And. Uh, and one of the little things says Trebor at the organ, hmm. which was me. I had a pump organ at the time, and we put it in the van and carted it up to uh, Haraz. And I think that was 1978, maybe. <laughs> and, and I was dressed in a mask and just was playing my pump organ. It was really cool. Yeah, it was very cool. So Robert has had a long, illustrious career in printing you know mm-hmm. and you've worked for the art department for over 20 years doing this with jazz mm-hmm. fest yeah yeah it's it's a great family to work for awesome mm-hmm. so what are we doing next uh f- for you and me yeah uh, our next um episode or are we doing philly finally i got to got to get to work on it i okay. um we uh like i told you i, I revisited the ben vaughn i was going i was going to get started um we're not going to do it today this was just to serve this was this episode is lip service mm-hmm. and we want to talk how robert got conscripted again he's always getting <laughs> conscripted every time we turn around you love that word <laughs> you taught okay, it to I, me I'm, I'm gonna say something except for dana's um silver tone 
1448. There, I did not see a single guitar with lipstick pickups in the entire festival. And uh, I, I was, you like, know, well, when we spoke Ron yesterday, Woods, Day, Ron Woods sitar. That was it. Yeah, yeah. But we spoke yesterday, and you said, "Let me see if I can even remember," because I know it's been a whirlwind. But I'm going to remind you. Then, you, then you took a picture of um, Amy Helm. Oh, 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 you're right. You watched her perform and you, you, you sent to me in real time. You said, hey, take a look at this. And was it a, a guitar line or a, it was a bass, it was, wasn't it? It was a, a, a bass. Mm -hmm. It was a, a Dan Electro bass. Um, and you're right. You're right. That was, that was the big sighting. That's what makes it so special. She's playing it and then another guy was playing it. Mm -hmm. And she could, you know, she, I didn't know who she was until you sent that to me. And she I love LaVon Helm, but for some reason I never kept up with his daughter, Amy. She, she has an incredible voice and she's a really good writer. Yeah, I checked her out and I was like, damn, she's cool. Yeah. Dana her lineage Kurtz. is cool. Her gear is cool. Her band is cool. Yeah, Dana Kurtz came up with her in New York. There was this really cool crowd of singer-songwriters in New York, which included Dana Kurtz, Amy Helm, um, Jeff Buckley, yeah. and Nora Jones, mm -hmm. to name just a few. And um, they all came up together. They were all friends. Yeah, contemporaries. And would go see each other at clubs and support each other. Yeah. So you must have loved that when she whipped that out. Oh, You sent yeah. me a picture. I was like, way to go, okay. Robert. This is how addled I am after <laughs> six weeks at Jazz Fest. It's kind of like when I ask all these musicians about tour experiences, they'll say, I don't remember. You know, I was too busy. And mm -hmm. I, and you said yesterday, you said, I'll see if I can remember because it, you were just so busy. And it, you, usually if I did get a chance to talk to you, it would be a quick text at 7 in the morning. Mm -hmm. You'd be like, I just mm -hmm. slammed a cup of coffee in my green drink, what you call your green <laughs> drink. What is that? We all need to know what this green it's drink. Just a, it's just a super green powder. All sorts of greens and probiotics and antibiotics and I mean, uh, you know, biotic stuff and uh, prebiotics, probiotics, <laughs> all that uh, proteins, blah 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 blah. I all the stuff you just need to stay alive when you're a musician. Um, Candace knows a lot about this stuff: eating healthy and mm -hmm. herbs, herbs. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, things about this dietary stuff, uh, and she knows how to cook. And I asked her what all she'd been doing besides having fun and enjoying her vacation, seeing her friends. She was like, I'm keeping Robert fed and caffeinated <laughs> and <laughs> alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. She did a good job. Well, because if she doesn't, then she can't go to the festival every day. Oh, she she was having the time of her life. Oh! And she performed. Tell me about this artist that you guys performed with. I saw her slam dunk, Candace, uh, with was she with the Lulu and the Broadsides. Mm -hmm. Somebody else was sitting in there. Tell me who this guy. Oh, that was Paul Seabar. I did not spell that for me. I don't. I did not know C who he. C E B A R. C -E -B. Paul Seabar. Right. And okay. he, <clears throat> for decades, has had a band called Paul Seabar and the Milwaukeeans. He is um, <clears throat> he is from Milwaukee and is just a great guy. He's a, a world scholar on uh, Cuban music and Latin music in general. I looked and him up and I said, how did amazing, I not know? Just one of those amazing people that everybody knows. It's like we were, we were sitting with him off stage at Bonnie Raitt, and in the middle of her set, she just turns around and goes, Paul Seabar, this song's for you. I was like, okay, well, all right. I was like, okay. And he, I saw the he picture. the most gorgeous song. I have to learn that song. And Candace was singing? Candace was singing a song called Horizontal, mm -hmm. which... Um, was done, I think, in the 40s or 50s by a person named Bunty Pendleton. 
Isn't that a great name? <laughs> Bunty, Bunty, Bunty Pendleton. It's called and, Horizontal? Yes. <laughs> and it's the only thing it. that Bunty Pendleton ever recorded. And, uh, and I love that song. And very few people have ever recorded it. It's it's hard to find. It's kind of a song you can, if it's a, if it's a deep cut. It's the kind of song you can make your own. People not even know you have to always let them know who sold it. Was, it, was the, it was the perfect quarantine song. Did he know the song? No. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I was playing it with Candace. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. He wasn't up there. No. So what did what did uh, what did Paul think about? Dana Silvertone. Did he weigh in he at all? He loved did... it. Yeah. He absolutely, and he sounded so good on it. It was like, it was like it was his, and he just always played it and just knew it. It was like, wow. I need to get fantastic. to the interwebs and find video. I saw the picture, and there's always video out there. It was a bunch of people. Um, wow, that was something. So... We saw some good stuff when we went down there, but I wish I'd seen more of you. But the one time that I did finally get to see you, we got to see you, Kevin. And I went to the BJ's and saw y'all performing. Candace sung with y'all too, and that was an, a, a fabulous night. The whole thing was fabulous. And you are fabulous, and you drove back. You're fabulous. Robert, I missed you very much. I missed you too. You're I missed, my talk I missed, therapist. Missed, I missed talking with people about lipstick pickups and I can't wait to get back into it and I can't yeah. wait to hear the Nat Turner Rebellion it's gonna oh my blow. god it's going to blow your what mind a find. well you are a find and I uh, missed you and I'm glad you're back back to business we got research to do we're going to mm -hmm. talk to people about Philly Soul and all this other stuff yeah, and we've right. got uh, a modest following now, but we hope it gets bigger and bigger. But we know that they continue to come back for more, and we will provide it. Okay. Rosie Flores, Paul Seabar, and the Milwaukeeans. The Nat Ooh. Turner Rebellion. Yes. And the Lipstick Pickup. Oh, Amy Helm. Amy Helm. I, need yeah. to, I didn't know, know who she was. And it's kind of one of those things you're like, wait a second. Now Google, I'm like, how did I not know this? Mm -hmm. You know, there's so there's so much to know, much more to know. And that's why I always never try to pretend that I knew something before I did. Mm -hmm. I just learned. I didn't, not only did I not know who the Nat Turner Rebellion was, I did not know about the Slave Rebellion of mm -hmm. Nat Turner and, uh, or Nate, Nat, um, and it's an interesting story, too. So we got black history, and they were all about uh, social consciousness and uh, fight the power. This is a picture of them. Anyway, for the... I um, love learning things. I'll, yeah, it's good stuff. I just so, want to learn things. And you're helping me. Thank you very much for your time today. Welcome home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank I you. Enjoyed, um, I enjoyed seeing you in New Orleans, but I'm glad to have you back. Mm-hmm. Mwah. I'll All see right. you soon. Bye. Signing off. Hi. Right. See ya. If you hear excellent tone and the sound of birds chirping, it means time flew and you made it through an entire episode of the Lipstick Pickup Podcast. Robert and I would like to thank you from the bottom of our hearts for sharing your time with us, and we hope you'll do it again soon. We have nothing to pitch or corporate sponsors to recognize, but we'd love your comments, questions, requests, or likes. Please subscribe or follow us in any forum in which you might have discovered us. Or reach out through email, robert at thelipstickpickup.com or emily at thelipstickpickup.com. We'd love to hear from you. <laughs>